I'm going to be presenting a short webinar, I hope very informational for you. It will explain a lot of the background behind how important um, preparation is for EBSC and how we need to spend a little bit more time um, on just the preparation aspect to perfect EBSD. And the lecture topics that I will be discussing today, again, I'm going to be starting off with a couple of reminders of some basics that I talked about in my previous webinar, equipment, mounting, coding, extremely important coding. I'm going to give you a tip uh, for mounting as well. I'm going to talk about what it EBSD is, why is it important, and then I'm going to move on to some applications for, EB, uh, for EBSD on the SEM, so how it looks, how, how it works, and then how to approach prep, of course. Then I'm going to get into some experimentation basics with grinding and polishing method, the use of light microscopy when you're combining all these different methods of preparation, which is important. And um, I'm going to be discussing a little bit about electron polishing for EBSD and iron milling as well, OK? Obviously, as all my webinars, the first rules of basic preparation is always make sure that you remember, wear gloves, right? You want to make sure that you keep your hands, which are full of bacteria, dirt, oils, water, and all sorts of junk, out of the results, right? We want to make sure that we keep the sample as intact as we can, and we got to make sure that we work in very clean environments, okay? Have your own tool set. Right, that's part of being really organized, making sure you, you take notes of everything that you do. Good bookkeeping is very, very important. And in this case, specifically in this case for EBSD, you can end up repeating processes up to six times. So patience, okay guys, very, very important. Sample handling, of course, the equipment, as I mentioned before, gloves, alcohols, you're gonna be cleaning your samples a lot if you're preparing samples for EBSD. So these alcohols become important. Glass slides, let's say you wanted to work in, you know, uh, with some wafers or that sort of stuff, glass slides that you need, razor blades for cutting, hacksaws, of course, wooden toothpicks. You, that's, the wooden toothpicks are more for, uh, you know, the preparation before you put it into the SEM, right? The conductive paths we talked about before. Scissors, paintbrushes, diamond knives, scalpels and conductive paints and tapes, which I'll talk about more, uh, and mounting, and of course, the molds. Again, the tip down there, having your old tool set is always very important. Sample handling, cutting. Um, we still need to consider the size of the, the microscope chambers, even though we might only need a couple of microns of the sample for, for our EBSD. So let's always never forget how important it is to make sure that we cut with proper blades, that we take the safety precautions of the blade in, into place, uh, that we make sure we cut with the appropriate blade so that we don't introduce that extra damage to our sample. Because remember, we are collecting information from a certain depth of our sample. So the crystals need to maintain integrity. And of course, because I will be talking about grinding and polishing, you want to make sure that you don't forget about our lapping tool, which can give us that amazing flatness that we require, right? Unfortunately, like I mentioned before, they're expensive, right? I, I was just looking into replacing one myself in the lab, and they're about uh, $2,500. So these can be very expensive, but the work that they do is, is extremely um, appreciated, especially when you can get a sample very precisely flat, uh, or grind it to very small um, sizes very quickly. So keep in mind the lapping tools for obtaining very, very flat surfaces. And also because of the micrometer that it has, the removal rate is controlled throughout. Uh, just a very good tool for polishing. Um, more sample handling in terms of mounting, right? Mounts, mounting the piece of metal closer to the edge, the outer edge of the puck, would help you more because what will happen is you have to tilt your sample uh, up to about 70 degrees, right? And you want to make sure that if that you can cause as little dis angle distortions to the sample. So I we suggest that you mount it on the edges so that way it's easier to control and target by the detector. Okay, epoxy versus bakelite, right? Epoxy is better, less charging, less drift. Charging becomes so important in there 
when you start collecting your, your EBSD patterns, you want to make sure that the sample doesn't move, right? A big deal behind that is charging effect, okay? Um, do not just mount your sample on just double-sided tape. Your sample will slip. That angle is, is, is really big. Just make sure that you have the sample either by the screw system of the holders or add some, some of that conductive paint that we usually use as glue as well. And again, to emphasize how important it is to use light microscopy when you're grinding, when you're polishing, consider these different methods here, bright field to um, make sure that non-flat edges stand out, uh, dark field, which is sort of the same thing as bright, just the opposite, dark versus uh, bright, uh, polarized light, which again, uh, places the light source, right? We wanna add an angle to it, giving us contrast, based on surface defects and other things that are hidden to the structure so like subsurface damage that we we might introduce so keep that in mind when working with polarized light and one that i enjoy work using a lot is dic again it enhances sample features that you wouldn't be able to see under regular light and again the light microscope is such a great tool to just ask for the questions and to check right if you you know grind and polish and you think you have a nice mirror finish Take, take five minutes, go into a light microscope, under polarized light, DIC, take a look under different contrast, and I guarantee you can see some scratches at around 600, 1,000 times, and your sample might not be good enough for EBSD, okay? So keep that in mind. Coding parameters as well. A lot of people don't tend to consider coding as a big deal for EBSD, but I wanna make sure that everybody knows that it, you don't wanna overcoat the sample. And in particular, you pretty much only have one uh, coating material to work with in terms of VBSD, and that's carbon, okay? It doesn't, it doesn't disrupt as much of, of, the, of the volume density of the sample, or it doesn't obscure anything that we wanna see, unless you code more than 10 nanometers, okay? So don't overcode the sample. Um, and again, just to remind you of the different coating parameters and different purposes of coating, I, I had the chart here uh, to make sure that you know that there's there's still the variety of coding materials that you can use for different applications. Now, I want to talk a little bit about what EPSD is, right? As you can see here, it's electron backscatter diffraction, right? It's an SEM-based technique to, to measure crystal orientation. I added the, the graph here in the middle to show you a little illustration of how it works. And then I have a, a, a later image where it will show you a little bit more details of how the detector comes in. And, and, and I think it will show the angle a little better. But as you can see, we are, we're going to tilt the sample um, to about 70 degrees, right? The electron beam comes down, interacts with, with all the volume of the sample. And then our phosphorus screen detects our pattern. Obviously, there's better technology out there, which I'll talk uh, a little bit more later. But that's just to give you a little overview of how it works. And hopefully at the end of your uh, scan, you will see a beautiful pattern like you see on the picture there on the far left, okay? Um, and this is a very useful tool to discriminate between phases, okay? It's applicable to every uh, crystalline material in theory, of course. Uh, EBSD is a surface technique with EBSD patterns originating from the first five to 50 nanometers of the sample. Okay, so we want to make sure that we don't cause as much damage. So grinding and polishing is, is probably the hardest out of all these three um, experimentation uh, techniques that I'll be talking about. So why is EBSD important? Again, good EBSD can provide you with the information below here, grain size, phase distribution, boundary properties, misorientation data, texture, strength, slip system activity, intergranular deformation. And again, the recent developments that have come up, you know, the, as the technology goes on, you know, more increase in sensitivity, faster acquisition times with better cameras, uh, the combination of EDS and EBSD, which is not fairly new, but it's also a great tool for integrated mapping, uh, the dual and cross beam instrumentation for 3D EBSD, of course, and also TKD. Um, I think we're going to have a webinar about TKD soon, so you'll be learning more about that. And obviously, the new detector technology with direct electron detection. 
Um, I'm not too familiar with this yet, but as I read more on it, I should will sh I will be sure to fill you guys in with, on uh, how the detector technology works. Um, how EBSD is set up. So as I mentioned, the sample will be tilted between 65 and 70 degrees to aim at the detector's phosphorus screen. You want to work at probe currents higher than 0.25 nanoamps, of course, because you want to make sure you have enough signal, you have enough brightness to make sure that you, you're getting the patterns that you need. And obviously, the accelerating voltage has to be high as well. Usually, you work at 20 kV for enough signal. Um, but sometimes, if you're working with very hard material, sometimes you might have to push the kV limit to 30 as well. Uh, the spatial resolution is down to the tens of nanometers. So you can get very, very precise work done here for EBSD in terms of uh, grain sizes and crystal orientations. The working distance um, that you want to work with in terms of the detector coming in will be between 12 and 30 millimeters. But obviously, this is very sample dependent. So usually, we don't want to have very, very tall samples in here so that we have uh, enough room to move up closer. You want to be more in the in the 12 to 15 millimeters working distance range. Well, I'm talking mostly for our instrument here at the, at the CCM. Um, in terms of speed, it depends on the step size that you're, that you're working with on your data acquisition. So you can have um, measurements taking from 0.0 uh, 0 0.0010 of a, of a second to one second per measurement. So it just depends on, on what the step size that you'll be using to collect your data. And in terms of angular resolution, you have between 0.25 and one degree. So as you can see, making sure that your samples are, are really, really flat uh, is very important. Um, now I'm going to get more into the experimentation side. Obviously, I'm going to be talking first about grinding and polishing. It's the most universal method of preparing EBSD uh, sam uh, metals for EBSD. But of course, there's a little bit of things that I want to I want to give you to help you further. Okay. Um, in terms of EBSD, you to minimize the amount of damage that you're going to be introducing into the sample. I want to recommend that you start at around 400 SIC there, um, because you don't want to start too rough. On the sample, I would even say start at 600 um, and just make sure that you control uh, the removal rate as you go through. Um, if you're working with a lot of softer metals like aluminum, I would even start at 800. Um, so just make sure that you minimize the amount of damage that you introduce in the beginning because as you move to the polishing steps, if you want to go from 6, 3, and 1, you want to make sure that you can control the contamination aspect there. So you want to worry more about the removal damage on the grinding steps, and then contamination more on the polishing steps and the final steps for the EBSD. Because uh, I tend to see that a lot of smearing issues or um, the residue of the colloidal silica that is left over on the surface after you polish tends to be the biggest problems. So in terms of the final steps when you're doing the colloidal silica, um, make sure that you leave your sample under a little bit of um, tab water or reverse osmosis water, if you are, have that available, and sort of pass a cotton swab through the surface, but make sure that the cotton is nice and, and wet as well to make sure that you sort of give it a nice extra clean to remove that excess colloidal silica that it might be on the surface um, after polishing, and then take a look at the sample at, uh, at the light microscope to make sure that you've removed all of the, all of the um, uh, colloidal silica that's left. It will appear sort of a, a rainbow, shiny color under regular light. Uh, so you will know if you have colloidal silica still on your surface. Okay. Um, finer diamond paste can be used as well for finer polishing, depending on the samples, of course. Um, one thing that I that I want to make sure that you know, difficult samples will benefit from uh, repolishing. So if you have samples that are, that you just can't remove the scratches from, um, you can make sure that um, by just adding some extra um, extra polishing compounds. So for example, a little bit of acid combined with your uh, final diamond or your colloidal silica can give an etching effect to uh, the slurry, um, giving it that extra polish that it might require for EBSD. Uh, but again, 
making sure that you work with the effective assets and not make a mistake, uh, of course, some experience is required, okay? It is really important that you clean your sample after every grinding step and polishing step. And if you can, make sure that you put your sample to, to uh, through sorry a ultrasonic bath with um, ethanol where you can remove some of those extra bit of uh, contamination effects that you may get from polishing and grinding. Make sure that you use different cloths for different materials is also very important. And some polishing notes on the side. Um, and as you can see here on my left, the picture of our um, instrument, Joe 7000 here. Uh, this is our microscope that has EBSD right now. Uh, but I think we will also be upgrading one of our uh, other instruments at the CCM. Our, our PFIB, our plasma fib, will be getting a, a new B EBSD detector. So, th so that will be fun to work with. Um, but getting back to the uh, polishing notes here. Um, Mechanical polishing is very good for multi-phase materials. Um, hard materials require fine diamond polishing before colloidal silica. So instead of using the, the, the grinding papers, you might just consider fine diamond polishing before you get into the um, slurry polishing. Uh, magnesium will oxidize in colloidal silica, so you have to do it uh, through um, electro polishing, then iron milling for oxidation removal. Um, homogeneous materials should be done via etching or e or electro polishing. Um, and uh, as I mentioned before, different cloths for different materials is key. That cross contamination aspect from uh, using the cloths for different materials is huge. Okay, so keep that in mind. Um, some of the grinding and polishing equipment, and here on the right, I have some parameters that I have uh, for some uh, steel um, that I tend to use. Uh, so use this sort of a, a background to how you should adjust some of your parameters on your machines for working for EBSD materials, right? So for the automatic polisher, you want to make sure you are working with uh, a fairly uh, fairly hard head force coming down. So the arm here will actually go downward. Um, and you want to make sure that your platen is removing fair, uh, moving fairly fast, but not um, not fast enough to cause all sort of uh, damage just in case, you know, you're having to uh, get an, an angle while you're, while you're polishing. You want to make sure that you can control the aggressiveness of your polish. So the platinum speed between 200 and 300 RPM will probably work. Um, the head frequency as well, because we want to make sure that our head spins also. So as it goes down, it also has its own um, spinning direction. You can have it opposite to the platinum. Uh, for flatness, and obviously make sure that you go and check your sample after polishing on the light microscope for that mirror finish, and make sure that you go under polarized light to check for those extra defects that are a little hidden from the from the structure of the regular light, okay? Um, one other machine that is extremely good for EBSD preparation is the vibratory polisher here. Um, I would recommend if you have a vibratory polisher, use it as much as you can. Um, it gives such a great finish to uh, the surfaces with a chemomechanical polish, the etchant effect of the colloidal silica, and the way that the vibratory uh, polishes the sample uh, in that horizontal motion um, gives it an amazing finish. And it also helps remove, um, in a more controlled way, some of that um, hidden uh, damage that you, you might leave from uh, not removing previous grinding steps. Um, for, uh, while polishing. So just make sure that if you have the vibratory polisher, you can do great work by just setting it to maybe a level two uh, and then putting it in for about two to four hours uh, just before you collect your EBSD data or even less. You know, sometimes I just put, uh, you know, the, the, the metal for about an hour before I start the EBSD collection and it tends to, great, uh, tends to give great finishes. Um, just to summarize the mechanical polishing steps here, this method is very, very useful for multi-phase materials uh, or for materials that have harder particles and softer matrices. matrices. Uh, ideal for ceramics or, geog or geological samples. I know that's not metal related, but I just want to make sure that I, uh, I mentioned that for all those people that want to uh, prepare EBSD for ceramics and, ge and geological samples. You might be in, in a little bit of disarray by just working in the in polishing and grinding mostly. Uh, so this is this is a great 
um, application for, for those materials. Surface relief and surface damage, contamination and corrosion and oxides are extremely uh, common problems for EBSD. So controlling how much you're able to remove the material and how your removal rate is controlled and cleaning your sample as you go through is extremely important for EBSD. You'll find out that a lot of the EBSD collection problems just tends to come from not good enough preparation. Okay, and as you see from my line just below, right? Good preparation is good results. Um, poor or non resolvable EBSD patterns can be caused by damage to the crystal lattice. So as you'll see, as I'll mention forward on, if you just bombard your sample with an ion beam, you'll get Aragon implantation. It will change the morphology of how the sample looks and you will not get to see the patterns that you're looking for. Okay, so keep that in mind. The more damage that you do, the more grinding that you do, the more the crystal lattice will be damaged. And things to know, um, surface topography, right? You don't want shadowing to appear or to happen as you're collecting data. Coating thickness, you wanna make sure you stay under that 10 nanometer um, range for carbon coating. Charging and drifting corrections, don't just mount on tape. Make sure that you continue to take the precautions by securing the sample well into that stage. Damage from grinding steps, again, going back and forth with the light microscope checking that you've removed enough or that you've maintained as much integrity to the sample as possible. Now I'm gonna be moving into the etching and electro polishing. Now this method is, is mostly complicated because of all the safety aspects that it has to it. So make sure that you wear the proper safety equipment all the time when we're working with uh, etching equipment and electro polishing equipment. Um, this is usually done uh, with another technician, if you can. Here at the CCM, we have the body system. Um, unless we know that you have been uh, working alone doing electropolishing for a while, then uh, if you come and talk to us, we might be able to bypass the body system, but we recommend the body system here. Um, obviously, when we you start to consider electropolishing, you have to keep things in mind, like um, the etchings or the electropolishing will attack second faces preferably and will attack grain boundaries excessively so we have to start thinking about the damage that the sample will initially take uh, this method can help expose an undamaged surface if mechanical polishing fails so if you think that all the grinding and polishing that you did was not enough you can also do this process afterwards this method um, uh, outlines the structure the grain structure which is good obviously and improves the pattern so we want it to be etched a little bit. So that's why I recommend the vibratory polisher a little bit after grinding and polishing because it will give you that extra etching effect that we sometimes require for EBSD. Uh, the contrast etches, which rely on formation of different thick thickness oxide layers to generate colors visible to using light mic uh, for using light microscopy. These etchings are not suitable for EBSD because of the, um, of the layers that they form. Um, so make sure that you don't use those contracts, etchets, etchets, <laughs> hopefully I'm pronouncing that right, uh, for EBSD applications, okay? Uh, samples should always be checked on my microscope as well after you um, you do your electropolishing and your etching, okay? Um, and on this one specifically, I mean, all of these processes are very repetitive. So again, I want to emphasize patience, okay? Um, cleanup is what takes the longest, just to make it a little bit uh, more friendly for you guys. Okay, so let's see how electropolishing works. So here we have the liquid electrolyte with two electrodes, right? We have the anode and the cathode here. Sorry, the cathode here and the anode, which is our specimen. The sample to be polished um, is etches, forms the anode, as I mentioned. Currently is applied, which, uh, which forces the metal uh, of the anode to dissolve and wander and deposit itself into the cathode as a coating. So you wanna make sure that you control the temperature, the cooling bath is important, and the, and the stirring, of course, right? You want to know, you wanna control all of these things all together. So the electrodes are connected to an external power supply and the voltage applied to cause reaction within the cell, okay? This experiment requires an experience. So please make sure that you take all of the necessary precautions, okay? So that's how it works. We have a voltage applied and it passes through. Um, as we control the temperature, the cathode dissolves and deposits right into the sample. Okay. 
as we this is a little bit more detail so i'll go through so making sure that you stay out of the a to b zone here the etching zone um because what will happen is as i mentioned earlier the the pitting will begin right if you if you stay in the zone you're causing the grain boundaries to be attacked first right the second phase is going to get attacked first you also don't want to have this b to c transition where you're with your electrolyte is really viscous, right? It just starts to form a layer. That layer will stay there. It will cause all sorts of problems with collecting your data. The best polishing you wanna have is between C and D here, okay? But you wanna make sure that the steering is controlled very well to make sure that you can, you can stay between those, those two zones, okay? If you have this pitting effect, you might have to consider changing your electrolyte maybe you're you're being too aggressive if you're having this viscous oxide layer forming your parameters need to be controlled a little better the temperatures need to be controlled a little better you want to make sure that you stay away from the d to e area not you're just cause, causing corrosion or oxides on your surface this is probably the worst case scenario you want to make sure you stay away from this area okay again steering promotes attacking so you want to make sure that you control the steering rate, the voltage. So curve uh, curve depend on the electrolyte used, of, of, of course. Over etching will cause topography. For multi-phase materials, oxidation will be a problem. Okay, so sometimes you won't you won't be able to get away from the oxide oxide formation. Okay, difficult materials will require repeated etching. So a lot of the times, if you if you have a sample that's not polishing well, you might have to run it a couple of times uh, to get what you need. And the etching must attack the sample uniformly and not introduce any layers. As I mentioned, you want to stay away from all these other outside zones uh, that are not the C and the D there that you see on the diagram. Um, electro polishing and etching uh, notes and summary. Um, the parameters of the etching are controlled by the composition of the electrolyte. So you have to make sure that you use the proper electrolyte for your proper uh, metal. The electrolyte temperature, again, you have to make sure that you take a look at that recipe and make sure that you have controlled the temperature well. And also making sure that the steering is controlled because again, it promotes the attack. It promotes an even attacking of the sample. And obviously the area that is being polished, right? How much area you have, right? The current density that you're gonna be uh, using for that amount of area for your sample. Just make sure that you know um, how big your sample is and what is the appropriate electrolyte for such a big area. Um, and of course the voltage, right? You need to know what is appropriate for that electrolyte to make sure you don't cause any problems. Um, advantages of this pre uh, preparation application is fast preparation processes, no mechanical deformation or smearing on your surfaces. As long as you clean your sample um, after the polishing is done, it could give you excellent surfaces for EBSD. The disadvantages for this is it can only work with conductive samples only. And of course, I say that even though this is a presentation about metals, but I wanna make sure that I tell you that this method only works for conductive materials, okay? Um, not all alloys can be polished as well. Preferential attack or pitting can occur um, between, between uh, polishing steps or if you repeat your steps. Uh, no edge retention, so if you have edges that are, are more pointy or rectangular in shape, you'll lose that aspect of them. They'll start to become round because of the etching effect or the polishing effect. Um, you have a limit to how much you can polish depending on, on the area or the size of your uh, polishing equipment, of course, and how much or, or the limit of how big your sample is because remember, you have to cut it to fit on, on the holders for the SCM or the um, instrument that has the EBSD detector. You want to make sure you limit the scratch um, and material removal as well. So that's why you want to make sure that steering um, is really, really um, promoted, or I would say. Uh, so just make sure that you you control all the aspects of, of, of this etching effect because it, all of them can cause problems on your sample. Okay. And the etchings, they can be electrolyzed. They can be extremely hazardous. So temperature control is extremely vital. Um, moving on into iron milling and plasma cleaning or etching. Um, this is another method that I tend to commonly use more for preparation of EBSD um, because I have a, well, we have a cross-sectional polishing uh, unit at the CCM and it tends to work extremely well for very, very quick uh, EBSD 
um, areas um, to polish very quickly. Um, but the only problem is they tend to be extre uh, expensive. Um, so just keep that in mind when when dealing with iron mills. They can they can really do great work, but they they're extremely expensive. Um, but anyways, uh, let's let's keep going here. Uh, plasma etching is a process like sputter coating, but reverse. High voltage is applied between the anode and the cathode, which ex expose oppose each other with a small gap between. The cathode is the target on which the sample is placed. Ergon is leaked under control conditions into the vacuum. Obviously, we want to do all of this under a vacuum. The gas atoms become positively ionized in a high electrostatic field between the electrodes. Positively charged ion, uh, gas ions accelerate towards the cathode and bombard the sample, eroding the surface. Obviously, you want to make sure that you control the, the way that you erode the surface, right? You want to make sure that you're, you're not causing a lot of that aragon implantation that I was talking about earlier. Um, ion beam energy must be low to prevent damage to the crystal lattice. Right, so you have to make sure you work at low voltages and currents, usually limited to small areas because these machines um, they tend to be very expensive. So they, I don't know, the usually the the sample size has to be very small, so they have to be under a millimeter squared, um, and usually two hundred microns of that millimeter squared takes about four hours to mill. Right, so. Um, be careful with with uh, how much time you spend on iron milling because you can cause a lot of a lot of problems to your crystal structure there. Okay, um, that that small size comparison that I was talking about makes it really unsuitable for preparing coarse grain geological samples. Again, I just want to make sure that I mentioned other um, processes for other materials other than metals today. Uh, there are many different suppliers and models of plasma etching equipment. In the market, those that tend to work with low power ratings tend to be cleaners, plasma cleaners, and those who have higher power and wattage tend to be the etchers, okay? Uh, just a little tip for all you guys who uh, potentially would want to purchase an iron mill. Um, can also be used to remove layers on the surface, such as oxide and contamination. So you can just use an iron mill to clean your surface. Um, this is the, well, not the one, but this is the, this, I, the cross-section of polisher that we have at the CCM. Um, and the way that this one works is, again, uh, we align um, a stage and we make sure that the sample rocks. I think my next slide will explain it a little bit more in detail. But what we want is we want to make sure that we control the rate that we're removing material and that we target only a few uh, maybe the first 20 to 40 uh, microns of depth of the sample because we want to make sure that we don't introduce too much of a shadow or too much depth into our into our mill because if we're polishing that edge, we want to make sure that we retain as much of the sample as possible. A shield, again, a great tip, making sure that we eliminate curtaining when we're when we're making um, our cross section polished samples for EBSD, uh, silicon wafers or just Epoxy, sometimes you can just put um, a little bit of epoxy on the top and grind it flat, and that, and that sometimes works as a mask if you're not too worried about epoxy on the top of your surface. Gone voltage and time of milling depend on sample material. Of course, you can spend up to 13 hours milling a sample, so just make sure that you understand uh, the milling effect and the milling aspects of your sample before you put them in. A little bit of research might be required. Um, so multiple samples may require, uh, sorry, multiple milling uh, runs may require, may be required to get better milling effect, okay? So keep that in mind. You might start with very aggressive to remove a lot of material, make a nice polished surface. You might go into the light microscope and check it and see, oh, I'm getting a lot of curtaining, a lot of, a lot of shadowing effects. I'm going to go back, lower voltage, lower currents, and just clean up my surface get rid of some of that curtaining aspect that I introduced in the beginning, okay? Here's the iron milling continued. Again, there's the schematic. Obviously, you wanna make sure that your sample is pivoting so you can have a lot of area to look at, right? And also, you wanna make sure that you avoid these steps here, okay? Make sure that you don't remove too much material between one run and the other, because right here, you, you're losing all of this area here to look at. So just make sure that if you are going to be doing multiple runs, that you stay within the same sort of uh, depth 
in, in cross section, okay? So just make sure. Uh, multiple runs again for better finish. Um, you can see how big the this beam sizes can be. So you can you can end up milling really, really large areas really quickly. Um, it just depends on the material. Etching rate is high at high voltages, but heat damage is low, and heat damage is high at low voltages. So making sure that you don't um, implant that aragon into the material, changing the morphology of the sample, and you'll and you'll be good to go. Um, Sometimes, uh, as a tip as well, make sure that you go into the light microscope, um, check one area, go back and do a, a cleaning uh, run. Make sure that you lower the voltage by maybe half and uh, do it at the exact same spot. Don't change any of the stage parameters. Do it at the exact, exact same spot and you'll find out that you, you'll be cleaning the surface a little bit. Um, I am milling in summary. It's usually routinely used for TM sample preparation. Just want to make sure that I, that I give a shout out to all of those people that might be doing TM prep and tuned in today. Um, relatively new prep technique for EBSD um, as well. Well, relatively new in the sense that now I feel like people want to consider it more because of how, how fast and, and, and uh, how e easy it can be to just uh, do EBSD, EBSD on, on eye milling. Um, the milling rate. Um, determined by is determined by the gun voltage and the current, the sample geometry, and the material being polished. So you have to make sure you keep all those four things in mind. Um, can accurately polish away a set thickness of material from the surface. Very useful for stereo milling. So if you know you have the same sample continuously, um, which usually that's what people want to do for EBSD, is they want to make sure that they grab the same um, patterns all the time for their runs. This, this is a very good method for that. Uh, these instruments are generally very expensive, as I mentioned. Uh, plasma etching should generally be used for means of cleaning or, <clears throat> excuse me, or um, improving your mechanical and or electrolytic, electrolytically prepared samples. So again, you can also use iron milling as a further step after grinding, after iron milling, uh, sorry, after electro polishing, just to further get your samples to be uh, at that EBSD uh, level that you want them to be. Uh, things to note, ergon implantation can be a problem, will be a problem if you're working with very soft materials. Um, there, therefore, you have to make sure you work at low voltages, again, low currents. Um, adding a protestic mask will help you tremendously. So I would say this is a must, okay? Um, and uh, I think that's it for that. And hopefully, after all of these methods that you've learned today, this is the type of pattern that you will see uh, once you have your detector in and start collecting your uh, your EBSD data. Um, again, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Um, it has been a crazy morning with our first snow here in uh, in the GTA area. So hopefully everybody around is is uh, is better off without this snow, I would say. Thank you guys. Here's the some of the references that I've used. And of course, please make sure you check out George meteorography practices, which is huge in terms of uh, what etchings to use, um, what electro polishing uh, compounds to use for for um, for your EBSD preparation. Uh, all of these references here are great. Just make, make sure you guys go and check it out. And of course, feel free to send me an email at martj59 at mcmaster.ca. Um, if you have any questions about uh, EBSD preparation um, or um, SEM as well. Great. Um, there's some questions that have come in, Joiner. So yeah, sure. First one, um, I mean that some people use MGO slurry as the polishing material. Um, is it a useful material for this purpose? And what are the differences? I think it just depends on how much removal you want to do to your sample. Um, and how much or what material you're using. Um, I tend to use mostly, mostly colloidal silica for, for my polishing, um, but I think, it, I think it just mostly depends on, on what, um, what material you might be polishing here. Um, I have here Chris uh, Butcher, who is our SEM characterization and materials characterization expert who, who can jump in and help me out answer this question. Chris? 
Uh, yeah, so uh, the problem with MGO is usually it's a little too coarse. Um, it depends on how hard the material is as to what sort of results you get. Uh, but on softer materials, you may run into the problem if you get too much damage with MGO. Okay, great. Thanks, guys. Um, next question. I have worked mostly with ceramics and glasses, and I always use acidic solutions for etching my samples. Are these solutions applicable for metals or not? It depends on how aggressive you want to be with your metal. I mean, most ceramics might require um, etchings that are not too aggressive for them, of course, uh, but there are etchings that will will uh, affect our, our metals pretty pretty badly that are used uh, for those applications there. Uh, Chris, anything you want to add? Uh, yeah, for ceramics, it tends to be things like hydrofluoric acid. So um, that's usually not good on a lot of materials. Um, it depends on how aggressive it is. So a lot of stuff with ceramics is uh, phosphoric, um, and hydrofluoric acid. So they might not work properly with metals. So it really depends. You tend to use more concentrated stuff with ceramics and minerals. So you need usually more dilute solutions with metals. It's specific. Depends on the sort of electrochemistry involved. Great. Um, which is the best way to fix the sample on the stub for analysis for a long time? Um, I would say it depends. If you have a sample that's mounted on, uh, mounted on a puck, you might want to double side uh, glue the sample to the stub, double sided tape in the back of the puck, and then maybe connect the bottom uh, or paint the bottom of the stub to the puck as well. That usually works really well. So holding the sample down. Um, so just small, what, what I would say is make sure that if you can glue the sample in some way, glue it. Uh, so we tend to use nickel paint or silver paint to glue our samples, even though sometimes it's just adding some, some of that paint to the back of, of the sample and just gluing it directly to the stub, just making sure that it doesn't move after, after we create the angle on, on the SEM. Yeah, just make sure you avoid tape. It's um, pretty much I can say. Uh, Chris, anything? If you can clamp it, clamp it. Um, if you have to put it on a stub, put it on a stub. Um, is it a problem to put the sample above or below the exact indicated working distance? So for example, if the indicated working distance is 15 millimeters and they put the sample at 13 millimeters, will this cause a problem with their results? Well, I think it depends. Uh, I think me and Chris had, had just dealt with this problem actually two days ago at the lab. So I think it depends on how much noise um, or how much signal you want to uh, live with when collecting your data. Uh, I mean, one millimeter working distance can, can make a huge difference in the amount of, of uh, bands that you can collect uh, when you're gathering your data. Uh, yeah, it's mainly the main effect you're concerned about here is whether you have the pattern centered or not on the phosphor screen of the EBSD camera. Um, if it's not centered and you're not getting all the pattern, then it's a problem. If it is roughly centered and you collect enough of the pattern, it's fine. Great. Um, performing EBSD analysis on samples that have undergone corrosion tests is quite difficult. Do you have any suggestions for doing such analysis on these samples? Um, I'm going to have to let Chris answer this one. It's a, it's, it's a difficult one. Uh, Sam, can you repeat the question? Yes. Um, performing EBSD analysis on samples that have undergone corrosion tests is quite difficult. Do you have any suggestions for doing such analyses on these samples? Yeah, so the thing that you have to do usually is is find a solution 
that will remove the uh, damage or the um, surface corrosion products such that you have a bare metal surface. Um, it might have to involve a bit of experimentation. But generally, if you have any residues left on the surface, it's hard to do. The other problem you run into um, is that the surface may not be flat. Uh, quite often, what's a good thing to do is not really do a lot of corrosion, but have some pre-polished samples that you've polished for eBSD, corrode them slightly, then remove the corrosion products with maybe a dilute acidic solution. Uh, that's not going to remove too much material. Uh, and then do EBSD. It, it, it requires a lot of experimentation. We've done a number of samples over the year with uh, over the years with a lot of nickel based alloys where we're looking at grain boundaries. And you always have to prepare the samples ahead of time uh, for EBSD before you do the corrosion. And you have to make sure that afterwards there aren't any uh, residues from the corrosion left over for EBSD. Because we're talking about usually 20 nanometers of any sort of deposit will affect the EBSD. Uh, great. Next question. As you mentioned, for EBSD, the sample must be mounted at the edge. If I want to do EBSD and SEM at the same area, is it okay to use it again for SEM or does it need to be mounted at the center of epoxy for SEM? Uh, no, usually the, the the stages on the SEMs are are make, are have enough um, area to be able to look at these samples while they're mounted on the edge as well. They should be fine, or they they have a a stage that tilts uh, up to probably ninety degrees, and you could be able to look at the edge as well uh, on the SEMs that way. Great, uh, just a couple more questions. Next, can we obtain any information from light microscopy that EBSD or SEM cannot provide? In terms of, uh, I guess, if you're doing metallography, um, maybe. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure um, I understand the question very well. Um, I, because I think you can you can probably do some light microscopy initially with some etching um, to find out some some uh, some of the phases in your in your sample and then you would move on to SEM to to sort of confirm what you're seeing and then EBSD to sort of um, get that extra extra step with crystal orientations and grain sizes and and, and all that stuff. Yeah, anything you want to add, Chris? Uh, well, like microscopy, you can see color. Can't in the other techniques. So, excellent. If point. the surface is colored, then you you may see something different. So, my color phase is my color grains. Okay. Uh, last question: Can TKD give us chemical composition? Um, I've never done any TKD, so I will leave this to Chris. Uh, well, chemical composition, I usually um, am talking about valence state when we're talking about that. If we're talking about elemental, uh, you can provide it, you can get the EDS detector to the proper position for the actual sample which is usually extremely difficult to do. So I would say in general, no. Okay, another question came in, so that one was not the last one. Um, just a, um, they, this person did not understand why you can't use gold coating for EDSD and why they have to use carbon. Could you expand on that a little bit more? I think what I'm what I was trying to get that is you want to make sure you stay away from heavy uh, metals of uh, when you're coding for EBSD. Um, that that was the point that I was trying to make there. Um, but Chris, would you want to add to that? Uh, yeah, if you 
do calculations about how the electrons interact with materials. You can see that, for instance, if you put a, a five nanometer gold coating on something, you're not actually going to get any patterns from the uh, actual sample because the patterns come from the sort of top layer of the surface and you're basically blocking them. So you might get patterns from the gold, but you won't get any patterns from the material the gold is on. It has to do with the atomic number. So you can put a thicker carbon coating on, and if the carbon is amorphous, it's a little bit better. But it, even with the coating, you do get an effect on the patterns because you are affecting the backscattered electrons that are coming off of the sample. You're also affecting the electrons that are hitting the sample. So you have it, it has an effect going in and it has an effect going out. So the electron beam going in, the backscatter electrons coming out. So you can't, you can sometimes get away with one nanometer of gold, but it might still have an impact on what your patterns look like.